Welcome once more to the hallowed halls of our grand library. In this near hour long tale, we dive into the depths of history and uncover the hidden knowledge held within the several swamps of Azeroth. We commence our exploration of Azeroth's swamplands by venturing into what could be considered one of the most treacherous among them all, appropriately titled The Swamp of Sorrows. The marsh known as the Swamp of Sorrows stretches along Azeroth's eastern shoreline, with boundaries marked by the Red Ridge Mountains, Deadwind Pass and the Blasted Lands. There are no major highways traversing the waterlogged terrain and it offers little attraction for us travellers. The sparsely populated area is home to a distinct group of orcs, unlike those found in the Burning Steps, as well as a number of malevolent green dragons and the Draenei, bitter adversaries of the orcs who refer to themselves as the Lost Ones. This swampy land experiences high humidity and near constant rainfall. Due to the seawater infiltrating the area, it has become a brackish marshland. Towering, dripping trees further trap moisture in the air, creating an environment as oppressive as a rainforest. As a fitting tribute to its name, the ocean estuary coats fallen logs and rocks with salt residues. The road has been painstakingly elevated just inches above the waterline to facilitate travel through this inhospitable region. This stagnant landscape is made even more treacherous by the presence of jaguars, towering bog beasts, and crocolisks, vicious creatures that lie in wait at the water's edge for unsuspecting adventurers. And because of this, settlements are pretty scarce in this territory, as the Swamp of Sorrows is largely forgotten. But in this tale, we will revisit its ancient history. In tales of old, the Swamp of Sorrows constitutes the northern section of a vast swampland referred to as the Black Morass. The southern part of the morass is now recognised as the Blasted Lands, following the occurrences related to the Dark Portal. Our archives within the library contain limited information about the bygone expanse of the Black Morass. The desolate wetlands of the Black Morass were once characterised by marshes, rolling hills and perilous swamps. It was a place where settlements often faltered and lurking threats abounded. The morass roads traversed the swamp, and the inhabitants of Stormwind typically steered clear of this barren territory, using the morass road solely when necessary for passage. Our first known historical account of the Swamp of Sorrows within the Black Morass commences with the Gurubashi Empire's jungle trolls. As their dominion neared its end, the Gurubashi tribes plunged into a devastating civil war. About 1500 years prior to the opening of the Dark Portal, the jungle trolls, sensing their waning influence over the land, resorted to a desperate measure in a bid to restore their once great empire. They sought the aid of a blood god named Hakar the Soul Flayer. Hakar granted the trolls formidable power, but in return, the bloodthirsty deity demanded souls as sacrifice. We have already told a tale of the Gurubashi tribe and Hakar the Soul Flayer in a previous story, one that related to the Stranglethorn Vale. If you would like to hear more about that lore, then there will be a safe portal connecting the two tales in the description below. Hakar's insatiable demands soon grew, and he became impatient with his devoted priests. Hakar instructed them to find a way to physically summon him into the world, which would have allowed him to directly consume the blood of his victims. Most of the Hakari were horrified by this proposition. However, a small extremist faction of the Hakari, known as the Atalai, chose to heed Hakar's terrifying wishes. Before the Atalai could complete the summoning, the other jungle trolls, including some of the Hakari which opposed this idea, rose in open rebellion against this tyrannical god. Even the Zandala tribe was drawn into this conflict, and this conflict culminated in the destruction of Hakar's avatar. Expelled from the jungles, the Atalai were relentlessly pursued and nearly eradicated. Nevertheless, a small group of Atalai managed to evade their pursuers and found refuge in the Black Morass, an area now known to us adventurers today as the Swamp of Sorrows. In this place, the Atalai expedently erected the Temple of Atal Hakar. Guided by their leader, Jamal Arn the Prophet, they were convinced that this location was the designated site for Hakar's return to Azeroth. 
Our tale now takes a turn and focuses on the former great guardian of the green dragonflight, known as Ysera. Ysera was entrusted with the duty of safeguarding Azeroth's flourishing wilderness. This mighty guardian uncovered the Atalai's nefarious plot to invoke the blood god Hakar the Soul Flayer within the new temple and decided to annihilate it. With incredible might, Ysera submerged the temple beneath the expansive swamp and assigned numerous members of her green dragonflight to protect the remains. Nonetheless, there is a belief that a few of the zealous Atalai might have endured Ysera's fury and renewed their allegiance to Hakar. We will revisit the subsequent events within the temple of Atal Hakar later in our narrative. Many years later, during the Grand Gurubashi Conflict, when the Gurubashi Empire faced off against the Kingdom of Stormwind, King Lane sought the aid of Medivh, the son of Aegwyn, the former guardian of Tirisfal. Medivh, a formidable mage, unleashed his incredible powers upon the Gurubashi forces, leading to the decimation of the majority of their armies. This awe-inspiring demonstration of strength cemented Medivh's reputation as the realm's greatest defender. The tale of Medivh and the opening of the Dark Portal is one that is too large to be told in one sitting, and thus will be told another time. But for now, we can go over an extremely brief overview. After the Gurubashi conflict, Medivh embarked on the journey to Karazhan, where he sought to master his magical abilities under the guidance of his mother. It was during this time at Karazhan that he encountered Morose, a loyal servant and friend to his mother. Over time, Morose grew increasingly concerned about the changes in Medivh's demeanour. Unbeknownst to both Medivh and Morose, the darkening of Medivh's thoughts could be attributed to the malevolent spirit of Sargeras, which had begun to manipulate his emotions and intentions towards a sinister purpose. Consequently, he made a pact with the Horde warlock Gul'dan from his chambers within the Karazhan Tower, promising to reveal the location of the tomb of Sargeras in exchange for Gul'dan to bring the Horde to Azeroth. With the assistance of Gul'dan's Shadow Council, Medivh managed to open the Dark Portal, creating a connection between Azeroth and Drenor. The portal connected the Orcish Horde forces from Drenor to the swampy realm of the Black Morass, marking it as their initial point of invasion into Azeroth. After the Horde's arrival into the Black Morass, the Orcs established two settlements and an outpost in the Swamp of Sorrows, Rockard, Stonard and Kairos. These towns, along with the later establishment of Black Rock Spire further to the north, served as the Horde's primary bases during the First War against the humans. King Lane sent Sir Anduin Lothar to investigate these new creatures. Lothar led a small group of knights on a scouting mission into the Black Morass, and this marked the first clashes between the Knights of Stormwind and the Orcs. Despite scoring some small victories, the humans were outnumbered in every battle. Unable to penetrate deep into the heavily guarded Black Morass to discover the Dark Portal's location, Lothar was eventually forced to withdraw. He reported back to Kinlane, warning that the invaders were amassing reinforcements. The kingdom then prepared for a full-scale war. And thus, the first war in the Eastern Kingdoms was about to begin. We won't delve into the story of the first and second war between the humans and the orcs, but for now it's crucial to know that the orcish horde, under Warchief Blackhand's command, would push out of the Black Morass, launching raiding parties deep into Stormwind's lands to sow panic among the human populace. The wars in the Eastern Kingdoms continued to rage for the next few years, culminating in the Second Great War. When the Second War concluded after the Siege of Blackrock Spire, some Horde forces managed to escape through the Dark Portal back to Drenor before it was secured by the Alliance of Lordaeron. To prevent the Orcs from returning, the Archmage Khadgar cast a powerful spell that destroyed the Gateway on Azeroth. As the Dark Portal imploded during the Second War, the southern section of the morass was separated and transformed into the desolate Blasted Lands. The northern part of the Black Morass was renamed to the Swamp of Sorrows in memory of those who had perished during the Second War. And it wasn't just the humans that had to deal with the aftermath of the Second War, the cataclysmic implosion left several groups of Draenei stranded on Azeroth. Many of them would later succumb to madness due to homesickness and the disconnect from their homeland, ultimately becoming known 
as the Lost Ones. However, a small faction miraculously avoided this grim fate and persevered despite the challenges they faced. These would become known as the Broken Exiles. Following the division of the Black Morass, the Swamp of Sorrows faded into relative obscurity. Some would say it's a nearly forgotten corner of Azeroth. However, this tranquility was soon disrupted by the resurgent Atalai, who, while rebuilding within the Sunken Temple, began to stir their fanatical zeal once more. After the submersion of the Temple of Hatal Hakar in ancient history, as events unfolded, time would become the most formidable adversary of the Green Dragons. The Green Dragonfly's vigilance was slowly succumbing to the insidious influence of the Emerald Nightmare. Murmurs of the Dragonfly's disorientation started to traverse the land, and surviving factions of the Atalai descendants rekindled their operations within the Sunken Temple. In a response to this, the mighty green dragon, Aranicus, received orders to confront a resurgence of the Atalai. Supported by his brother Itharius and a quartet of young drakes under his immediate authority, known as Dream Scythe, Weaver, Hazas, and Morphaz. The dragons of the Green Dragon Flight were dispatched into the Sunken Temple with a mission to decisively stop the resurgence of Atalai and prevent the awakening of Hakar the Soul Flayer. They managed to vanquish Hakar's corporeal form, believing that they had achieved a victory. Regrettably, they had underestimated their task. The sinister influence of the Emerald Nightmare began to not only affect the Green Dragon Flight, but also Aranicus himself leading him to falling prey to the same malevolent corruption that the current Emerald Dream was enduring. Both the Nightmare and the Trolls pushed the dragons into a state of madness and corruption, and once again gaining a firm grip on the temple, the Atalai initiated their dark rituals to bring Hakar back into Azeroth. It was during this period that Thrall's Horde sent forces to investigate the peculiar events within the temple. The tale of the Sunken Temple would then reach its climax when Itharius sought assistance from the Cenarian Circle. This led to the dispatch of an Alliance force to purify the temple, and these champions engaged the Atalai adherents, thwarting their malevolent rituals and eliminating all radical trolls from the Swamp of Sorrows, at least for the time being. Following the occurrences at the Sunken Temple, the Swamp of Sorrows would then experience a period of relative quietude until the shattering of Azeroth. During this cataclysmic event, the landscape of the Swamp underwent dramatic alterations. The outer boundaries of the Swamp ruptured, permitting the Great Sea to inundate the land. The rising waters further submerged the Sunken Temple, and the eastern region sank deeper beneath the water's embrace. But like we say in the library, where there is darkness, there is usually light, and this transformation led to the emergence of new settlements in the Swamp of Sorrows. Following the Second War, Stonard, a once fully operational Orcish Horde town, was deserted after the implosion of the Dark Portal. But since the Cataclysm, it has since been re-established as an outpost, coinciding with the formation of the new Horde and the renewed Orcish interest in the region. The town is fortified by eight-foot walls, and vigilant sentries man every gate to ward off potential Alliance assaults. Despite the limited swamp traffic, the Orcs remain watchful for any threats. They organise caravans that journey to their allies in Stranglethorn Vale twice a year, exchanging valuable ore for supplies. In the northeast of the Swamp of Sorrows, Bogpaddle stands as a newly established neutral Goblin Harbour town. It is under the rule of Trade Baron Silversnap, who humorously touts the town as the sole beachfront resort and military-grade weapons emporium in the Eastern Kingdoms. Surprisingly, his abode has garnered popularity among the factions of both Stoneard and the Marshtide Watch, despite the ongoing warfare. Revelers from both sides can be spotted in Bogpaddle, mingling with the goblins who engage in lively beachfront festivities. Much like Mudsprocket and other similar outposts, Bogpaddle maintains an affiliation with the Steamweedle Cartel. The denizens of Bogpaddle are considered part of Gadgetzan. And if you would like to hear more about the goblins of Gadgetzan and the Steamweedle Cartel, I will again leave a safe portal to the lore and story of Tanaris down in the description below. Furthermore, the Alliance marked a significant milestone by establishing a modest presence in the Swamp of Sorrows, 
breaking a hiatus that had lasted for millennia. Known as Marsh Tide Watch, this port outpost just north of the Temple of Atal Hakar is now home to Alliance forces. Their primary objective is to reclaim the Swamp of Sorrows from the Horde, with a particular focus on challenging the Horde's primary stronghold, Stonard. Marsh Tide Watch is equipped with various assets, including cannon towers, stables, and a blacksmith. While intense battles unfold in the neighbouring Bloodmire region, some Marsh Tide forces, along with their Horde counterparts, can be seen unwinding in the goblin town of Bog Paddle. After the Dark Portal was once again accessible, Broken Exiles made their journey through it, finding a new residence in the Swamp of Sorrows. They built their new community in the already established town known as the Harbour Ridge, and during this period, Anchorite Avun arrived to join them and study their condition. Avun dedicated years of effort to finding a remedy for the Broken's affliction. The sinister energies that had once corrupted them had consequences beyond the physical distortion of their bodies. It also severed their connection with the comforting warmth of the light, leaving them unable to feel its presence. And so, our journey through the history of the Swamp of Sorrows comes to an end. From its humble beginnings as a desolate marshland, to the epic battles and mysterious events that have shaped its destiny, this murky region has witnessed the rise and fall of empires, the clash of factions, and the enduring spirit of those who call it home. The Swamp of Sorrows remains a place of intrigue and danger, a testament to the ever-evolving world of Azeroth. That concludes our first Swampland narrative. Moving forward, our next voyage will lead us across the Great Sea, landing on the coastlines of Kalimdor, in particular, the territory surrounding Theramore Isle in Dustwallow Marsh. Dustwallow Marsh is a sultry wetland in central Kalimdor, situated to the southeast of the Barrens and to the north of Thousand Needles. This marshland remains in a perpetually soggy, muggy, and hot state unsuitable for conventional settlements and a sanctuary for creatures that thrive in dampness and humidity. Orientating oneself can be a formidable challenge in this vast jungle, where towering trees cast deep shadows and where raptors, spiders and of course crocolisks patiently stalk, seeking their prey among those who dare to approach their dwellings. Many intrepid souls have faltered on their path within this dense wilderness. Dustwallow Marsh has gained its reputation through the long-standing presence of the Alliance on Theramore Isle. The island's rugged waters make sea travel from distant ports a challenging endeavour. Paradoxically, the most secure approach to the Alliance stronghold is through the treacherous swampland. While it may pose difficulties for travellers, it provides them with the opportunity to craft remarkable stories. In today's account, we delve into those ancient narratives. In ancient times, the area now occupied by Dustwallow Marsh was a lofty plateau, abundant with herds of animals that thrived amidst the tall grasses. However, around 10,000 years ago, during the climax of the War of the Ancients, a cataclysmic event known as the Great Sundering unfolded. The implosion of the destabilised Well of Eternity led to the fracturing of ancient Kalimdor. Only a mere 20% of Kalimdor's landmass remained while the remaining 80% sank beneath the ocean's depths. Fortunately, some of the regions in central Kalimdor endured above sea level, and one of those ancient regions is present today as Dustwallow Marsh. However, it did not come out unscathed. In contrast to the once vast high plains that covered this land, the intrusion of seawater transformed the landscape into the marsh we now observe. The inhabitants of this area suffered severe losses and the creatures here underwent a kind of Azerothian natural selection. As a result, the only creatures that now inhabit this marshland are those well suited to its challenging conditions. Dustwallow Marsh has become the habitat for water-loving murlocs, groups of raptors, herbivorous kodos, and of course, the fearsome crocolisks. Owing to the lurking dangers within the Dustwallow Marsh, human presence in the region was virtually non-existent for countless centuries. That changed with the arrival of Jaina Proudmoor. Amid the Scourge invasion that ravaged the Eastern Kingdoms, Jaina Proudmoor gathered as many survivors from Lordaeron as she could, and sailed west to the long-forgotten shores of Kalimdor. 
Years later, during the pivotal final moments of the Third War and the epic battle of Mount Hyjal, all surviving humans, dwarves and high elves from Jaina's expedition established their new settlement along the coast of Dustwallow Marsh. Here they constructed the island fortress of Theramore to protect the remaining members of the faltering Alliance. In typical Alliance fashion, rather than fading into obscurity, they embarked on an expansion of their modest dominion within the Dustwallow Marsh. The Alliance forces extended their reach into the swamp, constructing well-defended watchtowers at strategic locations along the road to the Barrens. Under the leadership of Jaina Proudmoore, the Alliance continued to establish what seemed to be a relatively peaceful control over the marsh. However, as is the nature on Azeroth, this peace proved short-lived and crumbled in the events that transpired as part of the Alliance's pursuit of undisputed dominance. One year prior, during the events of the Third War, Jaina's father, Dalin, the esteemed Grand Admiral of the Alliance and Supreme Commander of their naval forces, received word that the new Horde under the leadership of Thrall were seizing ships from South Shore. Following a journey laden with adventures and a tale to be recounted on another occasion, Dalin would pursue the Horde to new lands. After the endeavours on this new territory were over, Dalin would then return to his kingdom of Kaltiras. Fueled by unwavering loyalty, he rallied a significant portion of his fleet and set sail across the Great Sea to Kalimdor. And he did so in search of his daughter Jaina and the survivors who had fled there following the fall of Lordaeron to the Scourge. Dalin Proudmoore held what you could call outdated ideology, he believed it imperative to crush the Horde before they could establish a foothold in Kalimdor. He instructed Lieutenant Alvarold to lead an exploratory fleet to scout the coasts of Kalimdor. These forces began raiding the coast and targeting Orgish settlements, including those of the Darkspear troll occupied Echo Isles. In an effort to safeguard his tribe, the troll chieftain, Vol'jin, relocated his forces to the Dustwallow Marsh. This newly established base within the marsh served as a hub for Rexar, Rokan, and Chen Stormstout. Rexar then successfully recruited the ogres of the Stonewall clan, who resided in the region, into the Horde by defeating their tyrannical leader, Korgal. Battle erupted throughout the marsh, culminating in the Kul'tiran forces' retreat, ultimately arriving at Theramore Isle. Upon arrival, Dalin was elated to discover Jaina's survival, but was perplexed by her unconventional company. Rexar the Mokhnathal, Rokan the Dark Spear Troll Shadow Hunter, and Chen Stormstout, the Pandar and Brewmaster, all allies of the Horde he was fighting against. Dalin promptly ordered their arrest, but Jaina intervened and assisted Rexar and his companions in escaping. Dalin, unwilling to entertain Jaina's explanations, seized control of Theramore and employed it as the launching point for his vendetta against the Orcs. And this is where he established a naval blockade around Theramore Isle to prevent a Horde counterattack. What the Admiral did not anticipate was his own daughter siding against him. Jaina came to realise that her father was trapped in the past, and that his obsession with the Orcs would only result in more unnecessary death and destruction for both sides. She aided Rexar in destroying the ships. Subsequently, the Horde laid siege to Theramore and fought their way to the Admiral's Keep, where Rexar confronted Admiral Proudmoore himself. Thrall attempted to reason with the Admiral, emphasising that the Horde had changed since their past conflicts. Dalin, however, remained obstinate in his belief that the Orcs could never change and engaged in battle. After a gruelling confrontation, Dalin Proudmoore, a victim of his own hatred, met his end. In the wake of these occurrences, Jaina not only had to grapple with the loss of her esteemed father, but also the deterioration of the fragile peace between the Alliance and the Horde. Following the turmoil incited by Dalin and his Kul Tirans, the Horde regrouped and established a larger encampment in Brackenwall Village to the northwest within the Dustwallow Marsh. This encampment was where the Horde enlisted the Stonewall Ogres. The Stonewall Ogres, who generally show little interest in the world beyond, have left much of the area between Theramore Isle and the Horde settlement in its natural state. Even the road leading to the Barrens was rapidly deteriorating. While Dalin Proudmoore's Alliance loyalists 
occasionally harass Brack and Wall, Jaina maintains control over her forces, and at that time most of the Horde members in the region were engaging in peaceful trade with Theramore. But as expected, from both sides there were some who continued to assail travellers. In the southern reaches of the marsh, the Black Dragonflight established its presence, and consequently these portions of the swamp have garnered the names Dragonmerk and Wormbog. Up until recent, the Stonewall Ogres resided in relative peace within Stonewall Village in this area. Before long, the Black Dragonspawn launched a devastating attack on the village leading to a harrowing retreat of the surviving Stonewall Ogres, the Brackenwall. And now these Ogres, as you would expect, carry a fervent desire for revenge against their assailants. The presence of the Black Dragonflight in Dustwillow Marsh is not unexpected, given that the region once served as the dwelling of the broodmother of the Black Dragonflight on Azeroth. Anixia, the daughter of Deathwing, had her lair situated in the southernmost extents of Dustwallow Marsh. The full story of Anixia is a complex one that exceeds the scope of our current narrative, however her downfall is a tale that can be linked to the Dustwallow Marsh. After her true form is exposed within the confines of Stormwind City, the Great Dragon seized the Crown Prince, Anduin Rin, whisking him away to her lair and daring his father, Varian, to follow. The Alliance swiftly descended upon her lair in the Dustwallow Marsh. This is where Jaina disabled the magical barriers, while Varian and his allies employed both steel and magic in an attempt to vanquish Anixia's brood. Before delving further into the fall of Anixia, it's crucial to recount some of the lore behind Varian Rin and why he might be referred to as either Logosh or Varian. Varian was once abducted by the Devious Brotherhood, acting under the orders of Anixia. During his captivity on Alcaz Island, a duplicate of his being was created through dark magic. During his travels, one of the variants proved himself a formidable gladiator in the lands of Kalimdor, and earned the moniker of Logosh in the Crimson Rings Gladiator Contest. Now with all of that information, we can of course proceed with the tale of Anixia's demise. Inside her lair, they encountered the broodmother herself holding Anduin hostage in her iron grip. Anixia threatened to end Anduin's life if Varian didn't surrender Stormwind to her. Anduin urged his father not to give in to her threats, and Logosh agreed to fight, and if necessary, die alongside Anduin. Logosh hurled a knife at the dragon's claws to loosen her grip on Anduin, who fell from a great height, but was saved by Brawl Beermantle, who transformed into a raven to catch him mid-air. With Anduin's safety secured, the Stormwind army pressed on. Both variants led the assault against Anixia, engaging her in, of course, fierce battle. Weapons and magic clashed with her numerous dragon kin as both sides fought relentlessly. Anixia cast a fierce spell on Brawl and tail swiped Jaina, removing them from the battle after growing frustrated by their spell casting. Desperate to end the fight, Anixia began casting the spell she intended to use on Alcaz Island to kill Logosh. The spell became disrupted by having two Varians in its path, and after a moment of silence, Varian emerged, his two halves fused back together. Anixia made a last ditch attempt to incinerate him, but Varian swiftly reached her head and impaled her with his newly fused elven sword, Chalamain. With Anixia's demise, Varian reunited with his son and friends, assuring them that their noble deeds would be rewarded and Stormwind had been reborn with new hope for the future. King Varian then decapitated Anixia, and would later display her head from the ramparts of Stormwind. While Brawl Beermantle summoned Roots to seal her lair's entrance and to destroy her unhatched progeny. After the demise of Anixia, Dustwallow Marsh experienced a period of relative calm and tranquility before the events of the Burning Crusade and the invasion of Outland. It was during this time that the goblins of the Steamweedle Cartel established the town of Mudsprocket in the southwest of Dustwallow Marsh. Similar to the seaside settlement of Bog Paddle in the Swamp of Sorrows, the goblins of Mudsprocket were considered an extension of the goblins of Gadgetzan. In previous stories, we've recounted tales of the goblins from Gadgetzan and Bog Paddle. If you're interested in learning more about these cunning beings, you can find a convenient and safe portal to those stories in the description below. 
Simultaneously, the formidable Grim Totem tribe, known as one of the mightiest Tauran tribes, extended their presence in the area. They established the Black Hoof Village in the northern reaches, where they held captive Theramore guards, eagerly awaiting a friendly rescue. This outpost also concealed the secret of the Shady Rest Inn's fiery demise. During the Cataclysm, Dustwallow Marsh remained largely unscathed by the Shattering. However, as often is the case in Azeroth, this tranquility was short-lived. Following the fall of Deathwing, Theramore came under attack on the orders of Garrosh Hellscream. Garrosh, the Warchief of the Horde at the time, had been chosen by Thrall to succeed him in the aftermath of the Cataclysm. Driven by a quest for notoriety, legacy and unparalleled dominance, Garrosh's hunger for recognition led him to believe that conquering Theramore would earn him the respect of the prominent Horde chieftains such as Bane Bloodhoof and Vol'jin. Garrosh's ambitions for the Isle extended far beyond common knowledge. His agents acquired information about the focusing Iris, and he ordered the assassination of the Blue Dragon tasked with protecting it. And so the Iris itself was delivered to the Warchief. In addition, Garrosh commissioned the creation of a Mana Bomb a potent invention developed by the Blood Elves years earlier in Outland. By forcing and manoeuvring the Alliance forces into the heart of Theramore, the Mana Bomb, enhanced by the power of the stolen focusing Iris, was dropped directly onto Theramore. The entire island was utterly obliterated. The casualties resulting from the swift strike were staggering including the loss of many of the Alliance's most accomplished generals, and it was fortunate that Lady Jaina Proudmoore herself narrowly escaped the explosion. This triumph would come at a price. Jaina, who had managed to survive the attack, was profoundly affected by the traumatic experience and the lingering energies of the Mana Bomb. She became consumed by a desire for vengeance against Garrosh, leading her to embark on a mission to annihilate him. Her quest for retribution took her to Ogrimmar, where she contemplated a similar fate for its inhabitants as the one her own nation had endured. However, in the end, she chose not to go through with it, and instead directed her rage towards Garrosh's fleet. As a result of the devastation in Theramore, the Alliance found themselves motivated and determined to step up their war efforts. Contrary to Garrosh's initial expectations of crushing them, while receiving updates of the naval battles from the newly promoted General Nazgrim, the Warchief received shocking news that the Alliance forces had been stranded during a naval confrontation in the south. This led to the discovery of an uncharted land rumoured to be named Pandaria. Garrosh was furious that the Alliance had reached this new territory ahead of the Horde, and he swiftly ordered General Nazgrim to assemble his finest troops to claim Pandaria for their own faction. Following the orders of Hellscream, years later Theramore Isle still remained in ruins with lingering remnants of the Mana Bomb's devastating energies. In the years that followed and throughout the conflict that was the battle for Azeroth, both the Horde and the Alliance explored the possibility of using Theramore Isle as a strategic base for their war efforts. However, the persistent energies from the Mana Bomb prevented any such establishment. After the Fourth War, Zikan and Rexar reported encountering ghosts in the ruins. The ghosts served as a somber reminder to Rexar that war leaves lasting scars on Azeroth, and what remains is never quite the same. With the awakening of the Dragon Isles, a group of renegade mages called the Sullied Banner arrived at the ruins. Led by Churi Flickerflame, a former apprentice of the late Archmage Ronin, they began clearing the rubble, extinguishing the fires, and developing prototype mana bombs. Their activities attracted the attention of the Blue Dragonflight. Instead of descending into conflict, the rogue mages, including their leader Turi, were apprehended by an adventurer, and Kalagos successfully persuaded them to abandon their hazardous endeavours. And this would mark the last known chapter in the history of Theramore Isle and the Dustwallow Marsh. In Azeroth's history, the tale of Theramore Isle and the Dustwallow Marsh serves as a poignant reflection of the world's enduring spirit. This once serene place held the delicate balance of life within its embrace. 
but the relentless march of war shattered its tranquility. Jaina Proudmoore's arrival kindled hope, only to be eclipsed by Deathwing's cataclysmic arrival, which foreshadowed a tragedy that would forever change the course of history. Garrosh Hellscream's quest for power culminating in the ruthless destruction of Theramore by a mana bomb, Jaina's transformation from a beacon of peace to a harbinger of vengeance, stands as a haunting testament to the heavy toll of war. And the scars left by the mana bomb's fury serve as a lasting reminder. In the end, Dustwall Omar stands as a testament to the resilience of life amid adversity. Theramore Isle remains a place of profound suffering, bearing witness to the indomitable spirit of Azeroth's inhabitants and their ability to heal the deepest wounds caused by war. Our account of the second swamp terrain comes to an end. Now we turn our attention back to the Grand Eastern Kingdoms, setting our sights on the historic Dwarven realm of Kazmodan as we embark on an expedition into the wetlands. Our tale starts off with the formidable Dwarven fortress, Ironforge. This city stood as the ancestral abode of the Dwarves, where their people thrived in tranquility for countless ages deep within the heart of the mountain. Nevertheless, their society expanded to a size that could no longer be accommodated within the confines of their subterranean city. While the venerable High King Modimus Anvilmar reigned over all dwarves with fairness, the seeds of division had taken root, giving rise to three formidable factions within the Dwarven society. The first one being the Bronzebeard clan. Under the rule of Thane, Madora and Bronzebeard, they maintained steadfast allegiance to the High King and stood as the traditional guardians of the Ironforge Mountain. In contrast, the second clan, known as the Wildhammer clan, led by Thane Kardros Wildhammer, resided in the foothills and craggy terrain surrounding the mountain's base, but yet they yearned for increased influence within the city. And then the third faction, the Dark Iron Clan, governed by the sorcerer Thane Thorisan, remained concealed within the profound depths beneath the mountain's core. There they were plotting intrigues against their Bronzebeard and Wildhammer brethren. While an uneasy coexistence was maintained among the three clans, the demise of High King Anvilmar, resulting from the inexorable march of time, plunged them into a relentless war for dominion over Ironforge itself. After years of bitter conflict, marked by the Bronzebeards boasting the mightiest standing army, they ultimately emerged as the victors, expelling both the Dark Irons and the Wildhammers from beneath the mountain. In the wake of the eternal strife that fractured the once mighty dwarven realm of Ironforge, the Wildhammer Dwarves embarked on a journey northeastward. There, amidst the rugged peaks of Grim Patol, they established their new capital. However, as the flames of the War of the Three Hammers reignited, the Dark Iron Clan launched a formidable assault on Grim Batol, nearly wresting it from the Wildhammer control. Only at the 11th hour were they repelled. Witnessing this irrevocable corruption and desolation of their cherished city, the majority of the Wildhammers charted a path northward, finding solace in the hinterlands. Meanwhile, a portion of their kin sought refuge in the lands of Northeron, an area situated in the utmost northern reaches of the Twilight Highlands, not too distant from their now-cursed former abode. When the flames of the Second War were kindled, the wetlands harboured several dwarven clans, their numbers totalling in the hundreds. Orgrim Doomhammer, War Chief of the Old Horde and Chieftain of the Black Rock Clan used his strategic wisdom and selected a diminutive island nestled in Baradin Bay of the Wetlands as the birthplace of his formidable invasion fleet. Opting for this place allowed for a direct route to the Hillsbrad foothills and enabled the Old Horde to circumvent the nascent defences of the Alliance of Lord Aeron. The bleeding Hollow Clan remained behind, entrusted with safeguarding the Horde's refining operations, while the Dragonmoor Clan took root in the heart of Grim Battle. The consequence of this occupation weighed heavily upon the region. The once abundant wildlife dwindled as both orcs and their dragons feasted voraciously on fresh prey, and the once pristine landscapes turned barren as even the flora bore the brunt of desolation. Those dwarves who could escape did so, while others, like Rom's clan, sought refuge beneath the earth, engaging in acts of resistance. Eventually, the Dragonmoor clan incurred the wrath of the Red Dragonflight, which, upon liberation from Orc enslavement, unleashed its fury upon them. 
The surviving orcs retreated south to the mountains, where they persist to this day. Following the culmination of the Second War, the region was reclaimed, and Doomhammer's port underwent a transformation, reborn as the Alliance settlement of Menethil Harbour, in homage to Lord Aeron's king, Terenas Menethil II. Subsequently, the forces from the Horde of Draenor staged an assault on the harbour, their aim being to commandeer ships and set a course for the tomb of Sargaras. As for Grim Battle, it was wrested from the clutches of the Dragonmoor clan by the vigilant Red Dragonflight. Post-conflict, the Bronzebeard Dwarves of Ironforge were resolute in maintaining bonds and trade with their Wildhammer brethren. To bridge the gap between Kazmodan and Lord Aeron, both economically and symbolically, they constructed the Thandor Span. In the north of the region, the Thandor Span stands as an imposing network of colossal stone bridges, forging a link between the rugged wetlands and the north of Kazmodan and the rolling expanse of the Arathi Highlands in southeastern Lord Aeron. This remarkable feat of dwarven engineering ranks among the most monumental projects ever undertaken in Azeroth, a legacy cherished and protected by the steadfast Anformars for no less than three generations. In days of yore, the land it traverses was recognised as the Thandol Valley. These formidable bridges possessed the strength to bear the burdens of entire armies, acting as the primary conduit for commerce between the dwarves and humans alike. Following the defeat of the orcs in the battle for Lord Aeron, Anduin Lothar relentlessly pushed the old horde from the continent, herding them towards Kazmodan by the way of the indomitable Thandor Span. The formidable bridges not long ago endured grievous harm in the wake of the ruthless assault orchestrated by Cam Deep Fury and Balgarus the Fowl of the Dark Iron Clan. In this harrowing skirmish, one of the twin bridges faced near total devastation. Valiant Dwarven troops waged a fierce battle to safeguard the sole remaining bridge and to recapture the adjacent township of Dunmoda. Our tale turns to Thargus Anvilmar, an Ironforge dwarf deeply devoted to King Magni Bronzebeard's reign who had once gallantly stood side by side with King Varian in battle. Presently, he holds the esteemed position of Patriarch within the Anvilmar lineage, serving as the final direct heir to Modimus Anvilmar, the ultimate High King to have ever ruled over all dwarfkind. Thargus Anvilmar received a royal summons from King Magni Bronzebeard, tasking him with the duty of rendezvousing with Varian Rin, alongside the valiant companions Valera Sanguinar and Brawl Bearmantle. Their meeting point was Menethil Harbour, where Thargus would serve as their guide for the journey back to Ironforge. Upon their arrival, Thargus led the group to a local inn, where he played a pivotal role in aiding the trio in repelling an encroaching band affiliated with the Defias Brotherhood. As the quartet journeyed towards Ironforge, their path was beset by an aggressive faction of Dark Iron Dwarves. The heroes, displaying their prowess, overcame this perilous encounter and their leader, Gunnar Flintrock, revealed to Thargas the dire plight of his brother, Yalmar Anvilmar, who had been taken captive by the Dark Iron Dwarves at Thandolspan. In response, the company unanimously resolved to embark on a mission to rescue him. Upon reaching Thandolspan, they encountered Yalmar imprisoned by Dark Iron Dwarves under the sinister command of Balgarus the Fowl. Balgarus harboured sinister intentions, aiming to end Yalmar's life by forcibly affixing the helm of the Anvilmars onto his countenance. Swiftly, Thargas intervened, severing Balgarus's hand before he could conjure a deadly fire spell, securing Yalmar's liberation. Balgarus, with his remaining hand, ignited one of the explosives, prompting Yalmar to sacrifice himself by shielding his brother from the impending blast, sustaining grievous injuries in the process. In his final moments, Yalmar entrusted the helm of the Anvilmars to Thargus, urging him to safeguard Thandol Span in his name. Honouring his brother's legacy, Thargas waged a relentless battle against the Dark Irons, playing a pivotal role in reclaiming the Span and exacting retribution for Yalmar's sacrifice. While Yalmar did not survive this perilous endeavour, his selfless act spared the last remaining bridge of the Span from complete obliteration. With the timely arrival of King Magni's dwarven reinforcements and the demise of the Dark Iron Chieftain, Balgaras the Fowl, the valiant company of heroes succeeded in driving the Dark Iron invaders from the Thandol Span and reclaimed it for the Alliance. Subsequently, 
Sargus made his way back to Ironforge, and it was there that the Assembly reached a unanimous decision to embark on an investigation concerning the mysterious disappearance of Marshal Windsor within the shadowy Blackrock depths. Thargus played a crucial role in this endeavour. Following these events, Thargus joined forces with the party in a resolute effort to drive Onyxia, the malevolent dragon, out of Stormwind and confront her in the treacherous Onyxia's lair. In the wake of their triumphant battle, with Onyxia's demise secured, Thargus departed alongside the returning Stormwind soldiers to the Eastern Kingdoms. His journey was motivated by the need to address matters pertaining to his brother's untimely demise and the management of his own estates. In a parting gesture, Varian extended heartfelt gratitude to Thargus for his unwavering aid and the bonds of friendship forged during their shared trials. He assured Thargus that he would always be able to find a steadfast ally in the city of Stormwind. For those who align themselves with the Alliance, Manothal Harbour may appear as a modest settlement nestled on the periphery of a rather serene region. However, this harbour serves as a remarkable hub for travel, boasting a direct connection to the Alliance's stalwart presence in Kalimdor, Darkshore. This link draws young Alliance Night Elves to embark on the arduous and perilous journey through the winding expanse of the wetlands, infamously known among travellers as the Wetlands Run. Their ultimate destination, the protective embrace of Ironforge's gates, from where they can continue their pilgrimage to the esteemed Alliance capital of Stormwind City. In addition to its connection to Kalimdor, Menethil Harbour serves as the embarkation point for numerous Alliance adventurers venturing into Northrend. Here, a direct route leads to the oldest Alliance settlement in Northrend, Valgard, nestled in the heart of the Howling Fjord. The Cataclysm, an event of immense magnitude, ushered in profound transformations within the very fabric of the wetlands. The serene landscape that once characterised this region was irrevocably altered as the earth trembled and the waters surged, reshaping the terrain and forever changing the face of this land. In the vicinity adjacent to the wetlands, within a region known as Loch Modan, stood a magnificent dam of monumental proportions, famously referred to as the Stone Wrought Dam. Situated to the east of Dunalgaz Pass, it traced its course along the northern boundary of Loch Modan. A marvel of the highest order, few are privy to the fact that its creation was orchestrated by the skilled hands of a Dark Iron Dwarf. Indeed, the visionary architect behind its construction was none other than the illustrious Franklorn Forgewright, a mastermind credited with the inception of the stone-wrought technique. However, for the purposes of our narrative, this dam holds profound significance, for it prevented the inundation of the wetlands beneath the waters. Yet, when the cataclysm wreaked havoc upon the world, the stone-wrought dam met its untimely demise as Deathwing, the harbinger of destruction, soared menacingly over it. This catastrophic event led to the breach of the dam, unleashing a torrent that surged into the wetlands. Adding to the calamity, the fanatical followers of the Twilight's Hammer sect hastened the dam's ruination by employing the malevolent Twilight Landshaper. The once thriving area saw a mass exodus of its inhabitants, leaving behind only a contingent of surveyors led by the capable Forber Slab Chisel to assess the extent of the devastation. The zealous adherents of the Twilight's Hammer acting at the behest of the Maleficent Old Gods and their dire master, Neltharion, laid claim to the stronghold of Grim Battle as a pivotal element of their expansion across the Eastern Highlands. Their relentless advance witnessed the brutal repulsion of the forces belonging to the Red Dragonflight. Regrettably, the labourers who toiled tirelessly on the dam are no longer present, their fate shrouded in uncertainty since the cataclysmic collapse and it is plausible that they may have perished in the wake of this disaster. Menethil Harbour found itself partially submerged, yet its resilient denizens persisted in their habitation. The once sturdy docks now float upon the water's surface, while sandbags form a protective barrier throughout the town. Many of its residents have sought refuge on diminutive isles or within rowing boats, as the town's keep fell under the control of the Dark Iron Dwarves. As you approach from the town's entrance, the right side bears witness to considerable submersion and destruction. Notably, the Maiden's Virtue, 
the ship that had graced Menethil Harbour for half a decade, now rests beneath the unforgiving waves. The Dark Iron Dwarves vacated their modest campsite near the span, leaving it to be adopted by a genial Dark Iron entrepreneur, specialising in the trade of uncommon quality goods. Furthermore, the Dark Iron residents of the span, along with Foggy McCreel, departed from the area. Alliance adventurers joined forces with Thargus Anvilmar in a concerted effort to eradicate the Twilight Hammer menace lurking in Dun Modra. In the tale of Azeroth's history, the wetlands stand as a testament to the enduring strength and determination of its inhabitants. From its peaceful origins to the transformative events brought by the Cataclysm, this land has faced numerous trials. As the forces of the Cataclysm subsided and the scars of destruction gradually healed, the wetlands embarked on a path to renewal. The dwarves, resolute in their pursuit of justice, reclaimed their lost territories rebuilding their settlements and strengthening their alliances with allies from across the realm. The Wetlands' story is one of enduring change and unwavering determination. It serves as a powerful reminder that unity and perseverance can conquer even the most formidable challenges. As the sun sets over the rugged terrain and the waters of Loch Modern glimmer in the waning light, the Wetlands continue to thrive, a living testament to the indomitable spirit of its people. As our account of the wetlands concludes, so does our narrative about the swamps of Azeroth. Thank you for joining us on this expedition through these diverse landscapes. Until we meet again, may the enchanting marvels of Azeroth continue to captivate you.